Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medhel Sned Podcast Season 4, Episode 1. We are back. We're back. We're back, baby. We're back. Welcome uh, back. Thank you. I am your I host. I've seen you a few times already. <laughs> yeah, still. I know. Well, uh, let me get through the opening okay, part. Fine. All right. All right. Uh, I, got a little, I got a little excited. I'm your host, Vika Slan, and as always, I'm joined by my amazing co host, Mr. Mike Ballian. Hi. Ballian. Ballian. Balian, Balian. Yeah, well, that's how it was pronounced. Remember that movie, Kingdom of Heaven? Yeah, with Orlando Bloom and like there was a pretty decent cast yeah. about the Holy Wars. Yeah, yeah. His first name was Balian. Balian. Yeah, and it was. So, what do you prefer, Balian or Balian? I don't know, man. It depends. I if think it's Balian. Listen, I mean, without getting into the race thing, but like mm-hmm. I have to say, it, when a white person says it, they're like Balian, mm-hmm. Balian, or something like that. I don't know. Whatever. All right, Balian. Well, well that's Mr. Armenian. Mike Balian, yeah. and where we discuss our great, great Armenian history, covering different eras, topics, and people. If you are listening to us on the podcast platform, please, uh, if you like what we are doing, give us a five-star review. Um, and if you are on YouTube, please go ahead and click that uh, like button and then make sure you are subscribed. Spe- speaking of subscriptions, I want to mention something. You know, over 50% of people who watch us are, mm-hmm. are not subscribed to our channel, which is very bizarre. And they're returning too. So I'm just not curious. So if you're watching us and you like what we're doing, yeah, subscribe. Subscribe. We don't it's bite. really quick. So. It's like just click. Yeah. So we were off for a while. Yes. Uh, I know we came back last week for a special episode that has to do with everything mm-hmm. that's happening with the Artsakh blockade. Uh, thank you, everybody, who's been watching that. Um, I think we have over 6,000 views on that. Uh, it was a great episode. Mm-hmm. We wanted to bring awareness to what's happening. It's still ongoing. And um, please, uh, you know, jo- join uh, everyone who is raising their voice about this, bringing attention to to it. Mm-hmm. We're doing our part. Thank you for everyone that turned out on Friday night. Yeah. Because we were talking about yeah. that, right? We were there. Um, it was a pretty good turnout, yeah. man. Yeah. And we a walked. Shor- a short walk. Short walk, but short it was walk, but it was a loud decent. walk. Yeah. A uh, loud <laughs> walk, yeah. Loud yeah. Walk. Especially when we went under the uh, the, <laughs> the bridge. Yeah, oh, the yeah. Bridge. That was, yeah. That was so. interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, um, uh, you know, as you know, I was in Armenia. Yes, sir. For, uh, so, Vic, what were you up to for the uh, last? <laughs> well, I got stories. Um, no, we. I was in Armenia for a month. I had an amazing time. I got to travel the entire country. And most of you who are following us see the videos that I'm uploading. I'm a little bit behind. I do apologize. I'm working on the rest. There's a lot of content. So uh, being back to work, family, and the rush of school starting again and everything. But I am going to get to them. I'm working on episode uh, four right now, which I'll hopefully have it within the next few days. And then I'll continue from there. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just making a suggestion. You know, I'm going to put some pressure on you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we should have like an episode of like some of your highlights from the trip. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, buddy? No, what do great you idea. guys think? Yeah, that's that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. We should do that. And, yeah. and I'll compile them together yeah, yeah. and we and can watch it. And something like fun, interactive. Yeah. Get everybody to kind of chime in. Good yeah. idea. We'll yeah. do a live. Yeah. Yeah, sure. perfect. That sounds good. But yeah, uh, Armenia was great. Like I said, uh, those of you who follow us on Instagram, you saw that I did post some um, some messages and things that I experienced. Um, it, it was a lot to take in, but uh, a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Um, I know people tend to concentrate on the negative, uh, but the negative, I, the way I look at it, is something that's supposed to help us um, become so, stronger. So more positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, besides that, we have, uh, a lot of guests this season, uh, uh, on the roster that are, we're just working the, the timing. Times. Um, yeah. so we'll, we'll announce them once we, we have that, but I do want to say that, uh, Christina Maranci will be on the show either next episode or the one after that we're working on, on the times. So we'll announce that as soon as it's ready. Um, what else besides that? Uh, oh, I want to thank everybody who's been ordering the the sculptures. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, make sure you use that promo code Artsakh, which, you know, uh, gives you 10% off. And we also donate a portion of that. We match it basically and we donate it to support our heroes, Armenia. And and we promise there's a couple new ones coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Mike's working on those. Yeah. Um, Always. 
besides that, uh, I'm excited to be back. I miss yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, man. Our it's mano it. a mano. You know, thir- Thursday nights were just not the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for like what three months? I'm sorry. I, I mean, listen, you. I filled it with uh, other things. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you did. Yeah, I was a little bit jealous, but I, I know, know I know, I know. It's okay, it's okay. But uh, today's episode, we're gonna go back and continue with the chronological order of the the mm-hmm. stories we were telling, and we're going back and we're gonna talk about King Sambat the second. Um, this is, uh, this is the time frame in the late 900s, uh, the Bagratunis, um, this is where it's almost starting coming to the end of the Bagrat. There's a few more Kings left after that, the Bagratuni dynasty kind of ends. So, uh, we're going to cover Sambat. We're going to talk about him and uh, things he did and, uh, you know, um, another, uh, th- I think this part was pretty important. Well, um, I, I mean, the whole, this whole time period is important. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. information. Yeah, uh, ba- stemming from about the, I mean, there's a lot of information. Period. But I think there's a lot more detailed information based off architecture yeah. and manuscripts and whatnot with literature and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. From, I'd say what like about mid eighth century, ninth mm-hmm. century, yeah. moving forward, yeah. right um, up until the i would think maybe what the end of the holy wars yeah that that yeah. era 12th yeah. century yeah. right yeah. 13th yeah. century so a lot of information yeah a lot of a lot of script a lot of text and also this is a time frame where city of ani the famous city yes. of ani is flourishing basically mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. all right i'm gonna put on my uh old man glasses as you know my eyes are getting worse by the day so i need help but um all right everyone so uh let's, let's uh dial it back to some medieval armenian time let's do it grab your goblets and uh settle in so <laughs> here we go so you know that uh that 22 year uh stretch from 970 to yeah 990 yeah, 990 yeah. Oh, well it was when king sambat was the main man in the bagratuni era of armenia and uh, let me tell you, he <laughs> his rule was the moment, basically. Like, uh, let's call it a mic drop. Like a mic drop right. moment? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, you know, that, 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 that was that the, era. That yeah. era, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I mean, you know, it's... It, like we talked about earlier in the in the in the prelude, call it, um, a lot of detailed information, and the impact was high. Yeah. yeah. Very high. Yeah, yeah. Now, during the latter half of the 10th century, the mm-hmm. Byzantine Empire was making its comeback, uh, like a 90s boy band, I would say. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's a good one. Wait, 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 wait. But except with more spears and yeah, swords, yep, right? Yeah, For sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, a lot okay, of spears. Okay, okay. A lot of spears. Okay. Um, they weren't just busy with the caliphate and the Muslim uh, uh, states. They also had their eyes on Armenia. Uh, they started annexing places like Taron, which is a cool name, but sounds like a uh, club DJ. <laughs> then more of a... Not the Lemajun place. Yeah, yeah. Not the Lemajun <laughs> place. Okay. Yeah, the Lemajun hey, place is great. Yeah, yeah, it is really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but listen, historical names. Yeah, yeah, you know, and this, is, this is how historical names work. We've gone through these names. Oh, and yeah. We're going to make some mistakes yeah, today, we've, too. We've so. fumbled a few. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the time Sambat II was kinging it up, Armenia was not that United Kingdom from the good old Ashot the first Bagratuni days. Uh, the new kingdoms were popping up faster than a hipster's coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> boy, you're, boy yeah. you came back rejuvenated yeah, after yeah, Armenia. Yeah, we huh? had some jokes, yeah. yeah. We have uh, Vaspuraka and Kars during Sambat's reign. Mm-hmm. Tashid, also going by Tashid uh, Zoraget or Lodi. Mm, Lodi. They had a few names. Uh, Parisos and Sunik. All names we've talked about before. Yeah. yeah. And um, if you're thinking that sounds like the lineup of a medieval music concert or something like this then um you're not alone yeah yeah speaking of musical festivals and concerts who's i've, tic- what I've tickets, mentioned what this. tickets are we buying no 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 i've mentioned <laughs> this uh, one of my other dreams besides doing animation and live action this and that i i really want to bring together a, an amazing like a three-day armenian uh music festival oh boy but 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 i want the artists that are playing uh, taking traditional songs and bringing them to like more modern, modern flair to it flair. there's a lot of bands like mm-hmm. that and it sounds so good um so again don't steal my idea all right 
wait till we have a budget. We'll do it. Okay. And make sure you are part of our Patreon and um, helping us so we can have a budget. Make sure, yeah, make sure, yeah. make sure I get in oh, VIP. You know what? I, I forgot to mention um, Patreon. Uh, we've got quite a few people who have joined Patreon. And I want to thank everybody who has joined us and supporting us. We really appreciate it, guys. Uh, again, it's not much. It's five bucks. Uh, every penny counts because we take that money and we're using it to all these projects that we're working Special, on. Especially the, you know, our yeah. uh, big project. Yeah. Uh, Forgotten Thrones. Yeah, Forgotten that, Thrones. Uh, we'll update you guys on that. A lot has happened. A lot has changed. Uh, all good stuff. Our goal is still to have it ready end of this year for the first episode. And then from there, it's going to kind of, it's going to be a lot easier yeah. because the character development, yeah. the voiceovers, everything will be ready. So there's a lot I mean, of things yeah. that goes into this. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it became lot. bigger than what we expected <laughs> and some amazing people are involved in helping us out. So, yeah. all right, not to digress, but, um, uh, you know, all these opening act kingdoms, mm -hmm. they were still grooving to the tunes of the main stage. <laughs> Um, the central Baghdadi kingdom of Armenia. Mm -hmm. By the 980s, Sambat II wasn't just a king. He was the king of kings Again, of Armenia. Again, there's, there's that yeah. term. Uh, it's like being the lead singer of a band and a guitarist at the same time and a drummer probably, you know. Well, so he's like a one-man act. One-man act, yeah. yeah. But he has two titles. So he was also dubbed as the Tiezerakal. Mm-hmm. Which, which basically means main, king it kings. means kings of king of kings, but mm -hmm. it, realistically, Tiazarakal means occupies all the space. space. Yeah, yeah, the entire universe. Yes. Um, so uh, you know, fun fact. You know, his uh, uh, his, his granddad um, also, I believe, what, what Ashot the third? No, no. Some some about, some the, about the first. first. Some about the first. first yeah. Um, and Ashot the third. On, and Ashot, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's why I said Ashot the yeah. third. Yeah, they also had the same title. Yeah, yes, and this is why I said, well, look at the term, yeah. King yeah. of Talk Kings. About, I am the King of Kings. <laughs> no, I am the King of Kings. Talk we about, are all the King of Kings. Talk about marketing and branding. Yes, right. And that's what we need to yes. work on. Yeah. So um, this title, Diazerakal. Yeah. Um, it's like calling someone Mister Worldwide. Like I said, he occupies yeah. the world. He yeah. occupies the space. Yeah. I mean, in literal sense. Yeah. But um. Sambat the second was the all-around main guy of Armenia, mm -hmm. um, recognized by everyone, everywhere in the region. Uh, the other kings, um, they were like local DJs. <laughs> since, we're, since we're talking about DJs, <laughs> I stick to the tune, yeah, right? Yeah. Pun intended. Yeah. Um, only famous in their neighborhoods, like you know, bedroom yeah, DJs. Yeah, yeah. You know, guys, remember that shoutcast. Hey. Hold on, I, hold I on. Used, yeah. I've, I've been on Shoutcast before. I've been a be bedroom DJ. That's yeah. where I started. Well, yeah, but like you kind of went places with it. I didn't. I just, somebody decided to put me on a stream yes. one time. I was driven. Twice. I was driven everywhere. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so no shocker, the kings that came after Sambat, mm -hmm. like Gogik the first and Hovan as Sambat, also went by Mr. Worldwide. Yes, I Mr. Mean, Worldwide. Uh, is it a call? It's a powerful word, though. It sounds way better in Armenian. Yes, the Ezerakalem. Yeah, but Mr. Worldwide yeah. sounds like a, uh, what do you call it? Like those parody yeah. comic characters. Yep. You know? So. Anyway, continuing on. Mm -hmm. The Bagratuni capital of Ani experienced significant expansion and prosperity during King Sambat II's reign as a pivotal hub of trade and commerce on the Silk Road, which bridged the East and the West, Ani's reputation quickly spread throughout the medieval world. The city's strategic location at key trade junctions undoubtedly contributed to the wealth and strength of the Bakraduni kingdom. The economic boom, which we all know what was going on with Ani, yeah. allowed the kingdom to finance a robust military and invest in advanced fortifications, castles, and strongholds across Armenia. That's what you do. Well, yeah, you're spending your money wisely. Yeah. You're not just blowing it on wine and nefarious things. Yes. One. Which uh, isn't bad either. No, but, well, sure. Yeah, but, but um, you know. That comes after. Fortifications. 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 And then. <laughs> so what's left? What's left in the royal account? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
One of King Samoth II's initial undertakings after ascending to the throne was the construction of new expansive walls in Ani. The city's rapid growth necessitated this expansion. By 979, merely 15 years after the first walls were erected by his predecessor, Ashut III, mm -hmm. the, the Merciful, yeah. in 964 we to 65. About, yeah, yeah of course. And all the yeah. things that, you know, all those amazing, well, I don't want to use the word technological, but I guess for its time. Yeah. Like those marvels that he built yeah. around Vaughn, yeah. right? And in Vaughn too. Yeah. Literally, Sambat II commissioned a new two and a half kilometer long and 10 meter high double walled fortification. This became known as Sambat, as the Sambatashen or translated into built by Sambat. Sambat yeah. Scholars attribute the design and construction of these walls to the illustrious Armenian architect, Tertad. Around 985, Tertad also constructed the patriarchal, patriarchal cathedral in Argina, a suburb of Ani's, uh, Ani's northern side. Yeah. Furthermore, main churches at the Marmesh, Marmashen, Sanahin, and Harbat monasteries from the latter half of the 10th century are credited credited to Tertad. Mm -hmm. Notably, Tertad later designed the magnificent Mother Cathedral of Ani, commissioned by both King Sambat II and his successor and brother, Gagik I, alongside Queen Katranid II. Mm -hmm. Kat 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 Katranid, do I say it in, in an American accent? Katranid. 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 Katranid, yeah. It's Katranid. King yeah. Vasak Suni's daughter, basically. Yeah. The walls were composed of smooth yellow stones, occasionally in inter interspersed with red and black stones that crafted ornate patterns of crosses, swastikas. Again, I have to stress, swastikas, sign of peace, longevity, harmony. Mm -hmm. This has been around for thousands of years, not the swastika that we yeah. know of. Yes, yeah. it's been around for thousands of years. And chessboard designs, as adorned behind... <laughs> Vic, see, we, we try our best. We did it. A makeshift <laughs> studio. Oh, so, speaking of studios, mm. sorry. Again, oh, yes. Yeah, yes. we are working on a new studio, guys. Uh, things got delayed. Uh, cost went up. <laughs> so we're working on it. We'll get there. So um, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. We're working on it. We're working on designs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Little homey feel to it. Little hint there. Yeah. Um, these walls featured 55 to 55 towers. That's a lot. Towers. Yeah. That's a lot. Mostly semicircular, um, with some squ some square towers. Intricate bas reliefs adorned the towers and walls, showcasing dragons, eagles, and other symbolic imagery. These fortifications enclosed an area of roughly 125 acres. It's pretty vast. Yeah. Further enhanced by an adjoining moat. Every fort needs a moat. Every fort needs a moat. Yes. Yes. I like moats. It's interesting. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. Bolstering the city's defenses. <laughs> Most are interesting. You know, uh, I mean, you know, you talk about these walls, like 55 towers, man. Can you imagine the manpower it took to to build these? And Well, I mean, you've got to build it in a short amount of build, time frame. Yeah, you've got to build the towers. F you know, they're, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they were used as lookout towers, 100%. Yeah. I mean, encompassing yeah. the entire... Yeah. You but know, outskirts you know, of while, the city. while this is being built, you're, you're also dealing with turmoil internally externally and your the show you must know, go this, on i know friend. but you got to do this fast sure you know so that's what i'm saying so imagine the manpower it took to be able to that build that these. and and the resources right because yeah. we're talking we, we mentioned about how the economy was booming so imagine the amount of resources they had at their disposal because things were growing so fast and things yeah. were moving so fast why because again we've talked about this a million times it was smack dab in the middle of the silk road yeah this was literally one of the centers of trade. Yeah. Right? All sorts of merchants from every side was traveling through. Mm -hmm. Some would settle, some wouldn't. Who knows? Whatever. Yeah. But well. the bottom line is you had so much resources at your disposal. You're just like, hey, we got to get this done. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. You built the 54th one. We're building <laughs> another 10 here. Yeah. Let's go, guys. Yep. You know? Yeah. And and like you said, you know, we've always been in the middle. And, and yeah. that's one of the main reasons we're in the situation we are today. Yeah. Armenia being, again, middle of the so everybody wants to go through Armenia yeah. because that's how you get to. It's more or less something that's occurring yeah. today. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 
Well, among the 14 gates of the Sambatashen walls, the main, the Vin and Kars gates were particularly grand and served as the primary entrance and exits to the capital. The 11th century Armenian historian Arsti, uh, Aristakis Lastivartsi, another name we just butchered, or I should mm-hmm. say I butchered, detailed these gates uh, were fortified with thick iron plates and reinforced with beams, ensuring they could withstand siege weapons and battering rams. So they thought about that, you know? Of course they did. make it strong enough to uh, to hold those big weapons they used back then. Atop the main gate, the Bagratuni dynasty's coat of arms, a lion beneath a sun disc with a cross was prominently displayed. Regrettably... The emblem suffered damage during the 1990s of course, the restoration works by the Turkish government, which oh. obscured and impaired Oops. the original relief. Yeah. Restoration works by the Turkish. Yeah. I, I don't even know if you can put those uh, words together. Uh, following the completion of the Sambatashan walls, King Sambat II commissioned a grand royal palace atop a hill within the capital's citadel. Mm-hmm. As the primary residence for the royal family and their companions, the palace was an architectural marvel boasting numerous chambers. Well, they needed their uh, VIP. Of course. Yes, yes, that's what the royals do. Mm-hmm. The Grand Hall, intended for welcoming esteemed guests, was meticulously crafted with finely cut stone and featured sophisticated carved uh, colonnade. Now, uh, a colonnade, uh, it's like a row of supporting uh, columns that support mm-hmm. the roof. So if you can imagine these bunch of I columns. Mean, I mean, it's just some stuff stuff like this, the, the grandeur of what they built. Yeah. It's just uh, imagination. Yeah. Right? It's Unfortunately, like, we, uh, we, we, don't we, have, can, yeah, we don't have like actual documented images or whatever the yeah. case is, but you can only just imagine probably yeah. things that we've seen in film and whatnot and how yeah. this must have looked mm-hmm. wild. Yeah. yeah. Um, adjacent rooms displayed exquisite plaster uh, reliefs the, depicting uh, diverse flora and fauna. Another hall likely used for dining dazzled visitors with walls portraying military scenes overlaid with gold leaf and an intri- um, uh, intricately carved wooden arched ceiling. That's pretty wild, man. Right? Yeah. Stone, wood. That must have been amazing. Mixture of everything, yeah. It must have looked amazing. I'm pretty sure it smelled amazing in there. Well, I mean, the floral thousand the, years the ago, woods man. they used and everything. Yeah. In 989, King Sambat II entr- uh, uh, entrusted architect Tartat to design the Mother Cathedral of Ani. This magnificent uh, uh, edifice concluded in 1001 under Gogik, uh, King Gogik I and Queen Katranit II stands as the testament of the Armenian medieval architectural prowess you said her name better than i did katranit yes okay way better okay thank you sir Mm -hmm. widely recognized as the church of the holy mother of god the cathedral uh follows a cross-shaped dome design with a rectangular layout now hear this many european art historians such as david talbot rice and joseph strizgovsky believe tertod's innovation innovations in architectural elements pioneered a gothic style that would dominate europe post the 12th century you know isn't that amazing one one would have to think considering i mean europe is europe we yeah. can't argue that right yeah. but there since in media and we've talked about this sometimes in media and movies and whatnot there's always been so much focal or focus put on um and attention to european architecture and whatnot right but you're talking about a booming, booming city. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally exploding, brimming economy, yeah. right? Who's to say that with those resources, they didn't go wild with the designs? And just like how we mentioned, that this style was something that was emulated yeah, further throughout yeah. Europe. I'm not saying Europe had none of this, because mm-hmm. there's obviously abbeys and whatnot. Of course, in, yeah. In cathedrals in Europe yeah. that were built in the 7th, 8th century yeah. that looked a particular way, right? Medieval architecture. Yeah. Um, but who's to say that people traveling across didn't see, hey, this city's booming the way it is. Yeah. 
let's copy their architecture because maybe it brings, I mean, who knows, whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it kind of happens today, right? No, no, I you know, agree. Look at, look at yeah. Dubai, yeah. right? Look, yeah. at, look at what Vegas yeah. is doing yeah. and other cities are trying to. Well, obviously to. they respected his his talent and, and his architectural yeah. skills. So, uh, you know, and, and like you said, it, it kind of dominated Europe's uh, architectural yeah. style mm -hmm. in the 12th century, mm -hmm. which is a lot later, obviously. Yes, yeah. a lot later. So. Um, in a surprising twist of events in 989, after an earthquake partially devastated the Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor Basil II of the Armenian dynasty, who we've talked mm -hmm. about, yeah. beckoned Tartad to oversee the repair. By 994, the iconic dome was restored its glory even more um, resplendent yeah. than before. Uh, Steve, uh, Stepan or Stephen of Taron, also known as Asorik, documented this feat in his Universal History, praising Tertad's unparalleled architecture prow architectural prowess and noting that the refurbished cathedral surpassed its original splendor. So they outdid themselves. We've talked about Asorik many oh, yeah. times before. Mm -hmm. With the Hagia Sophia's restoration accomplished, Tertad redirected his focus to completing the Mother Cathedral in Ani, his most distinguished creation by 1001. Soon after, he embarked on another ambitious project, the Gagakashen Cathedral in Ani, um, which was uh, built or worked on between what 1001 to about 1005, yeah. if I recall correctly. This grand cathedral, aptly named Built by Gagik, quote unquote, mm -hmm. was inspired by the stunning 7th century Armenian cathedral of Zavartnots. We all know about Zavartnots yeah. and that unbelievable structure, which, by the way, is a, we, we, you know, it's a UNESCO, UNESCO yeah. World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. um, tragically, uh, we do know that Zavartnots had likely succumbed to a severe earthquake and probably other series of earthquakes ever since, specifically in 983, which also decimated the old Armenian capital, Davin. Yep. In homage to, or paying homage to Zavartnots, Tartad envisioned a revival, yet chose to construct this reincarnation not in the suburbs of the erstwhile Armenian capital of Vagarshapat, but in the heart of Ani. That Interesting, must have looked, right? That must have looked unbelievable, man. Because, I mean, dude, looking at, looking at the ruins of Zavartnots yeah. now, that place is still unbelievable course, looking, man. Course. I mean, you can't, it's still sick looking. Yeah. It's, it looks like something, sorry I'm saying this, but it looks like it's something that's like still like in Egypt or something, but it's in, yeah, it's in Armenia. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, while the Gagashen Cathedral mirrored Zavartnots in several aspects and was also dedicated to St. Gregory the Illuminator, the gifted Tertad integrated several unique architectural elements to differentiate and elevate the, his new masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. He was a talented man. And uh, a lot of these architectural things that we're mentioning, um, I got to see. So I was in Hachpat, Sanahin, yeah. uh, one of the most amazing places I've been in the Lodi region. And uh, um, I told you this what I experienced when I walked into the yeah. Hochbat Monastery, yeah. my God. And and we'll talk about that when we showcase yeah. those. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be showing some clips uh, while, you know, I'm sure you guys are seeing it already, but we're going to be showing some clips, some aerial shots that I took of these places that we're talking about. So the architectural marvel of the Gagashen uh, uh, Cathedral was further heightened by its impressive sculpture com uh, sculptural component particularly the near, uh, nearly in the round polychrome statue of its patron, Gagik I Bagratuni. The grandeur of this statue, which depicted the king in a regal purple robe presenting a model of the cathedral, was unlikely uh, another uh, any other. Uh, elevated to the uh, north facade, it stood as a testament to the king's monumental contribution. Discovered by Professor Nicholas Marr during the 1905-1906 excavation of Ani, the statue distinct uh, the, the statue's distinctiveness lies in almost three-dimensional nature, set apart from the cathedral on a niche rather than as a flush relief. So, it wasn't you know typically they carve it into the yeah. right they'll carve it into the walls of the the cathedral or something. And I saw a lot of that, but this yeah. was unique by yeah. itself. 
this uh, uh, this deviation from the uh, conventional can be somewhat l uh, linked to the sculpture of K King Sambat II and Gurgen the first at Hochbad's holy sign church, although those were arguably more rudimentary in uh, in form. Renowned photographer Adam Varud captured this unique piece of art, further immortalizing its grandeur. You know, um, I mean, obviously I sculpt in 3D, right? Yeah. Like I would consider myself an artist. I think seeing unbelievable marble sculptures and whatnot, or stone, stone sculptures are absolutely ma like masterpieces yeah. but seeing a relief well done like i know when i visited paris last year and i saw some of the most unbelievable relief work that i i think i've a solid yeah. piece of marble like as big as this wall yeah and i mean the detail on it and how far it was popped out that i it still baffles me like even even in 3d some of the things that i do it's still difficult and but these people were chiseling it yeah real stone it's right amazing. like it's unbelievable to me it's, it, yeah yeah when, and when you hear about like solid relief work and you look at the detail work how, oh, how consistent it is the 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 and they the make curvature, it life like yeah. and it's maybe what like maybe pops off of the surface of the wall by maybe yeah. this much you know yeah. what i mean it's not a full you know let's call it 3d sculpture yeah it yeah. just pops off this much, but it looks like a life story is being told. Yeah. Wild yeah. to me, man. Well, in the aftermath of the political upheaval, Ani's rich treasures faced a tragic faith. Uh, following the occupation of Kars by the Kamalist forces, Ani's museum was ransacked and annihilated. We know a little about this. Mm -hmm. The loss of the artifacts was staggering, including the revered statue of King Though believed to be lost forever, in 1998, a glimmer of hope emerged when Georgian scholar Georgi Kavtaradze chanced upon a small fragment of the statue, specifically the hand of King Gagik, during a visit to the Museum of Erzurum, historically known as uh, Karin. It became evident that the statue had been shattered with only this minuscule fragment rescued and transported to Ezrum again, unfortunately. Um, the tragic destruction likely dates back to 1920 when General Kazim Karbekir of Muftas, uh, Mustafa Kemal's forces, notorious for his campaign against the Republic of Armenia, established Ezrum as his operational headquarters. The misrepresentation of these artifacts' significance is another uh, is another layer of tragedy. Mm -hmm. Instead of recognizing the fragment's historical importance, the local Turkish museum presented it as a part of a fish or a lion statue. A hand. Yeah. As a fish or a yeah. lion statue. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like to... Oh, I'm, I'm just going to stop there. I mean... I, 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 <laughs> stop stop the mystery surrounding this journey of this fragmented statue to the museum remains unsolved uh architect vanik hachaturian has sculpted the king uh, uh that king kangi statue might have been part of a more extensive uh ensemble possibly featuring queen katranit ii or even the statue of christ, christ symbolizing yeah. king gagi the first offering to the gehkashen cathedral the loss and the subsequent misrepresentation of such invaluable artifacts underscore the tumultuous intersection of art, history, and politics. And politics. Well, yeah. that went well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, we all know uh, what, what they've done. Uh, b before the 1920s, there was at least still a lot of artifacts there, um, still uh, building standing, but we know what the Turkish government did, and we're not... You know, it's not something that I know people tend to shy away about this, but this is reality. No. Turkish government, yeah. they destroyed they everything. masters at rewriting and, history. Uh, Azerbaijan is doing a, has done it before, mm -hmm. and they did it in Nakhi Javan, and uh, they're doing it right now with with our, you know, lands in Artsakh. So. Re rewriting history or, or covering it up yeah. with their own yeah. things. So. But I digress. 
Some about seconds um, consolidation over the castle of Shatik and its essential trade route led to a series of events that would reshape the religion, uh, the region's political landscape. While the intra Bakraduni dispute between Simbat II and Musher, which we have talked about also, yeah. was resolved without bloodshed, thanks largely to the diplomatic efforts of David Bakraduni, Musher's decision to involve the Salarid Emir, Abul Haya, was a miscalculation with far-reaching consequences. Yeah. As it might have been. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we've... Yeah. Read yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've had seen we've this script yeah, many yeah, yeah, times. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, you, you trust your foe yeah. or what, what, what whatever, but there's they have their ulterior motives. Of course. Do they not? Yeah. Of course they do. The presence of the Salarid Emir in Armenian territory heralded an era of devastation as Davin fell. To his forces and the countryside bore the brunt of the Salarid incursions. God, they went after everything. The desecration of the monastery of Horomos, particularly the removal of the cross atop the Church of St. John, was symbolic of Abul Haya's intentions towards the Armenian populace. Yet his ambitions were cut short, not by Sambat II or any of the Bakraduni rulers, but, but by Abu Dulaf al -Shaibin, Shaibani, a Muslim ruler of Ghortan. This unexpected turn of events, where a Muslim ruler thwarted another expansionist's policies, underscored the complexity of the politics in the region. Interesting. Inter right? Internal strife. Yeah. Is it not? Abu Dulaf's successful confrontation with Abu Haya, sorry guys, follow me here with some of the uh, Middle Eastern names. Led to, a, led to a shift in a in power dynamics. Davin, um, which obviously had seen a lot of hardships, as we've talked about, yeah. which was a central to which was central to Armenian heritage and power, was recaptured and added to Abu Abu Dulaf's domain. Now again, <laughs> Abu Haya. I know there's Abu Dulaf and then there's Abu Haya. Mm -hmm. subs subsequently, subsequent assassination by his own subordinates was a stark reminder of the perils of overreaching ambition, but that goes on in every of course, kingdom yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the narrative shared by the Armenian chroniclers regarding Abul Haya's supposed remorse over the desecration of the monastery of Horomos painted a picture of divine retribution. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Resonating with a common motif in medieval chronicles where hubris is met with downfall. This period exemplified the intricacies of alliances, feuds, and the changing political landscape of, the, of medieval Armenia. Within this volatile context, religious institutions held significant sway, not only as spiritual centers, but as, a symbol, as symbols of power, yeah. resistance, and divine judgment. Everything was divine back then. The saga of Sambat II, Mushar, and their contemporaries uh, offered a window into the complex interplay of politics, uh, faith, and ambition that shaped the course of Armenian history during the Bagratuni era. One can only imagine mm -hmm. that all of these things came into play because, again, I'm not trying to paint my own narrative, but you can only imagine when you have that much money at stake with a trade route hub like Ani. And the yeah. surrounding areas, there everything comes into play. Of course, everything. Just and like, just and like I today. think that's one just of the. Just like today. Yeah, but just uh, like today, with anything I else. I mean, that that is one of the main main reasons to be able to oh, yeah. to to do this because or or make a decision to do something like this, right? It's because end of the day, it's it's wealth that makes you powerful to be able yeah, to money, do the fortifications money, wealth, and this money and is the driving money. factor yeah, absolutely there you go and, so. then, and then everything else kind of becomes like this yeah side play religion politics yeah everything yeah everything but, kind of comes into play yeah. with this and and funny enough th this when we when we do more episodes about the Bagratunis and, and their entire dynasty how it comes to an end you're gonna see how all these decisions came into play yeah um and it's, no, the it's, good it's, and bad and bad yes yeah. mostly bad <laughs> well i'm trying to stay optimistic here yeah well it's history it's done i, mean, I know <laughs> but still but uh, don't give it away yeah 
The 10th century was a period of great turmoil and rapid, sh a rapid uh, shift of power in the Armenian landscape. Um, as Abu Dulaf looked to extend his territories, the changing dynamics between the emerging Rawadid dynasty and existing Saladid dynasty had a ripple effect across Armenian kingdoms, shaping the geopolitical mm -hmm. chessboard. The untimely demise of Hussein I, the Rawadid emir, turned the tides in favor of Abu Dulaf, but also prompted him to recess his strategic alliance. Now, recognizing the threat posed by the growing power of the Rawadids, Abu Dulaf, guess what? Turned to King Sambat II, mm. seeking his mm. support. Right? Interesting. Mm. The diplomatic mediation by Catholicos Khachik I Asharuni underscores the integral role religious figures played in a political decision making during that era. It was not just about military might, but also about creating political, social, and religious alliance to maintain stability and resist external threats. And we mentioned this a lot that how the the Catholicos and uh, the 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 church was uh, always involved. They were like a mediator. They were always somehow uh, an advisor. Oh, yeah. they, they, stuck, you know. they stuck. Well, I mean, I'm being more negative about it, uh, but they they stuck their nose in everything. They had to know everything, right? Because they were viewed differently. Uh, I mean, sure. right now, church and state aren't mixed anymore. But back then, they were, you know tied together different topic for yeah. a different podcast yeah. yeah i guess so yeah <laughs> but maybe on the wise nuts uh <laughs> yes <laughs> love you guys um the shift in the uh allegiance to sambat sunni after hussein the first death only highlighted the intri uh, intricate nature of the alliance during this you know, time you know it's interesting this abu dulaf character turning to sambat for aid assistance yeah. help whatever you whatever you want to coin it as um interestingly enough like i wonder how bad i know we only have only so much detail that we're going to talk about how bad was like how that gloss over with his other um muslim or islam compatriots you know what i mean like that I'm, well. sh I'm sure one can only and, assume and the same but, thing and we're going to mention this yeah, is, uh, yeah. uh, vice versa right of course so, i mean yeah. but he, Think about how you can also manipulate that, right? Like I'm sure, and I'm sure we'll probably get to but it. But that, that goes back to also at, Even as the, the person who's being asked for the aid, it's like, well, wait a minute. You guys are yeah. supposed to be working together and you're coming and asking me for help. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just but also, I think, you know, if you look at historically within the Muslim religion, you know, you have the Sunni and the Shia and they. Yeah, they, I they mean, yeah, they've they've had problems, problems they've, yeah. they've, for thousands of years. Yeah. Well, not thousands, but like since their yeah. creation. Yeah, they've had problems always. Um, yeah. But uh, the transition in leadership of the kingdom of Kars uh, from Musher to his son Abbas solid, uh, solidified the hierarchical structure within the Baghdatuni dynasty with Sambat II positioned as the Azgapet. Mm -hmm. Azgapet meaning head of, of the nation. The it was clear that while individual Baghdatuni rulers held territories and kingdoms, they all ultimately acknowledged the overarching authority of King Sambat II, as asserted by Matthew of Edessa. And 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 this is even before we we, we know when, when we had um, divisions between uh, Gagi Gartruni and, and you know so many other uh, kingdoms that you know the, they, the, you had these the pockets division, of division seems uh, to be the part of our factions history. of kingdoms and things yeah. like that. Yeah, they were kind of like you know obviously it was an ego trip. Uh, but at the same time, at the end of the day, they recognize yeah. the main kingdom of, of Armenia. So, um, I am the king yeah. of kings. <laughs> uh, here's a crown. There's a here's crown. A, you, yeah. wait, what was it? Yusuf. Yusuf. Yeah, yeah Yusuf. Yeah. That, that guy. Crown giveaway guy. He was Cap the Oprah of uh, He's crowns. The, Yusuf the crown giver. Yeah. <laughs> the the term Azgapet, while emphasizing Sambat's stature within the dynasty, also symbolically represents the unity of the Armenian nation under the Bagratuni rule. Abbas Bagratuni's rule over Kars was marked by his commitment to ensuring safety within his domain. 
evidenced by his initi- uh, um, initi- initiatives uh, to eradicate, uh, eradicate highway robberies and establish order. So basically, it was like interesting. You know, he was he was clearing out the roads and all the BS yeah. that was going around. I mean, again, Silk Road. There's probably yeah. a lot of bad stuff yeah. that would go on. Yeah, probably at nights. It's like the train robberies of the Western. I mean, days, that. You know? Yeah. So or things that are happening modern day. So the creation of the Godmara Godmaraza guest mm-hmm. Gund, the elite regiment of red coats, showcased Abbas's commitment to the strengthening his military forces, a key move that likely contributed to his successful rule. Moreover, his establishment of the monastery of Shirimk further solidified his commitment to not just political and military power, but also to religious and cultural prosperity i'd like to know what this uh godmara's guest gund looked like like what they what they w- would wear well he said red coats yeah, yeah yeah but i mean red coats it's a broad yeah <laughs> brush to paint with <laughs> you know but like I, i'd be curious back then in this time era what they actually looked like like what was the red coat about it like what what did they wear like i wish I mean, if we can find I'm some sure sort of there's some, some something has something, to be, right? I would, no, I'm not kidding. I would kill when, when we were looking into this, um, I was like trying to imagine what they would look like. Yeah. It's just my imagination, but I'd love to see what these guys would look like. They sound pretty damn awesome. Yeah. We can ask not mid- the British red coats, not the British red. We coats. can ask mid journey. <laughs> God. <laughs> Enough. No, don't do that. Don't, don't ask me. There's probably somebody yeah. typing right now. Yeah. Like prompt. God of Raz guest yeah. wound. With six fingers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway, the <laughs> evolving geopolitical narratives of the 10th century, from the Rawadids and the Salarids to the Bakraduni dynasty, reveal a tapestry of power struggles, alliances, betrayals, and moments of diplomatic wisdom course diplomatic wisdom had to come into play because this is just too much going on right of course from too many different sides as dynasties rose and fell and as leaders sought to extend their territories it became clear that the survival and prosperity of the kingdom were not just about military might but also the ability to form strategic alliances respect religious traditions and ensure the well-being of the populace yeah sounds like they got all the grounds covered the intricate tapestry of Armenian political and cultural heritage during the reign of Sambat II's um, time brings forth the complexities of a landscape marked by power struggles, familial alliances, and the interplay of art, religion, and statecraft. Yeah. I mean, everything bled into everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, that when you're talking about alliances, the, you know, once once that... that that friendship is established. Let's call it friendship. Sure. Um, then, you know, everything else kind of starts has mingling. To. It has to. Together. I mean, uh, so I'm sure it was probably like some of the more intricate things discussed. Yeah. Hence, why we mentioned the word intricacies. Yeah. There's. But here's one thing I gotta say: uh, if we go back, if you think about Yusuf and everybody else before that, and even during the Vahanans War and the Vartanans War and everything, at least they respected its religious traditions and. And, sure you know things like that that's very important you had to because again that area it's just the area had so much going on you had the rise of islam yeah at this point what maybe two or three hundred years right? a lot of caliphates that yes. happened it was all about getting yeah. rid of christianity yes. from the armenians but, right so but there seems to be some sort of um uh i guess Push, <laughs> push to maybe be cohesive yeah. in some way, shape, or form. And yeah. again, I would assume, I would assume that the the economic structure was the driving factor. Yeah. Hey, we can all make money here. Well, you, right? you also mentioned, uh, you know, you had families mixing at this oh, point, sure. marriages and things yeah. like that. So yeah, but I'm sure that played a big role as well. Um, the established um, uh, the establishment of the kingdom of Tashir by Gurgen or Kyurik um, Bakraduni showcased the fag- fragmentation of the once united kingdom of Armenia. Despite being separate entities, the mutual recognition of Sambat II as the Azgapet or 
Heid, Heiragluch um, by his brothers Gurgen and, and Gagik speaks volumes about the intricate hierarchies and loyalties that existed within the Bakraduni clan alone. I mean, yeah. it still must have been massive even on their end mm -hmm. to manage all that. Such acknowledgments also reinforces the significance of the quote unquote head of the nation or patriarchal role that Sambat II held in this period. Yeah. So he was a big dude. Yeah. Yeah. He was a very big dude. Well, he got help too, right? So, I mean, I mean you're going to need help. Yeah. It's not easy running a kingdom. No. Um, a particular poignant representation of this acknowledgement is found in the Hachbat Monastery. I mentioned I've been there. Mm. It's amazing, beautiful. The relief of King Sambat II and Gurgen I holding a model of the Holy Sign Church is a symbolic testament to the collaboration and mutual respect between the two. The church, completed in 991, and the adjoining monastery of the Sanahin, founded by their mother, Queen Khosrovanush, reflect the harmonious fusion of the religious reverence and royal patronage in the era. Furthermore, the involvement of the eminent architect Tartad in the construction of these edifices solidifies their place in a pantheon of Armenian architectural marvels. And I got to tell you guys, I am, I, I, you know, when, when I, when I put those videos up, yeah. um, it still doesn't that do was justice. Awesome. Um, I, I mean, Hachbat and Sana, especially Hachbat, I, I want to go, I would stay in Hachbat for months. The, the, the beauty, the nature, the, it's just amazing. And being in that, walking into that cathedral, the, the feelings and the emotions I got and, and, I've mentioned this many times. I am not that religious. I, you know, I, I, I practice Christianity as much as I can, but I, you know, anyways, not to get into it, but I walked in there and what I felt, I have never felt in my life. And mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating. And I was by myself. I went to that church by myself and I, but, but I mean, I have to say this, I mean, I might get a little deep right now, but that's not religious. That's spiritual. Yeah. Man. Well, that's, you that's know a what different, I mean. yeah. that's yeah. a different thing you felt. Yeah. That wasn't religion. You downloaded. Yeah. That was other uh, things yeah. you downloaded. Yeah. Uh, and and, 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 and when, when we go over it, I will, your Wi-Fi, I'll, your I'll, Wi-Fi was yeah. bursting. And, <laughs> and when we do the idea you had with, with going over the, you know, yeah. doing yeah. the kind of you know, watching it together yeah. and commenting and stuff, I will tell you guys the story and exactly what happened and what I felt. Yeah. So stay tuned. So the UNESCO World Heritage recognition of Hachbat and Sanhain monasteries underscores their global sig uh, significance. These complexes are not just bastions of religious piety, but also hubs of cultural, educational, and architectural excellence. Mm -hmm. The relief portions of these royal siblings in Sanahin Monastery further emphasize the interconnectedness of religious and regal realms. Now, Sanahin's transformation into a bishopric seat in 979 and its subsequent uh, prominence as an educational center. Uh, by the way, the, all this stuff is written over there yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, positions it as a uh, crucible of Armenian theology, philosophical, and scientific thought under the stewardship of figures like, uh, I'm going to butcher this, <laughs> the Dioscoros Sanahanetsi, the complex flourished. I love his first name, Dioscoros. Dioscoros. It's not Ar Armenian. I know, but like, so what, did, what did his friends call him? Dios? Dios. Or Skoros? Yeah. Good point. Or Sako. <laughs> okay. um, the library's expensive collection, the scriptorium's contributions, and the presence of luminaries like An uh, Anania uh, Sanahensi man, and Hakop Karapensi showcase Sanahin's uh, pivotal role in the cultural and intellectual evolution of Armenia. Getting some tongue twisters there. Yeah. I, I knew I was going to get those parts. <laughs> You usually uh, give them to me, man. Karma, yeah, bro. well, karma. <laughs> We're it's the first episode, yeah. so I was being nice. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> legends of esteemed figures like Grigor Magistores Palvuni teaching at the school further embellish the rich tapestry of Sanain's history. 
Um, and and by the way, in Sanahin, when you go there, on the walls, there's so much inscriptions written. And and what it is is the beauty about it is, so they didn't use numbers. What they did is because the Armenian alpha, alphabet also has numbers with yes. it. They use the letters to tell the dates and things yeah, like that. Yeah, like which very, is, very reminiscent of um, Roman numerals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Armenians... Very interesting. Th- wait, yeah, I do recall that Armenians do have their own system of what, what would be described as like your letter to, num- to number system. Yeah. 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 So um, his association with the Magistros uh, Seminary Bridges and the Realms of Religion, Royalty and Education encapsulating the uh, multifaceted dimensions uh, of Armenian culture heritage during this period. As the kingdom of Armenia fragmented and um, uh, reconstituted itself through various monarchs and political shifts, it was the confluence of royal patronage, religious fervor, and intellectual pursuit that ensured the legacy of its golden era would endure through time so um it sounds like no matter what direction the political winds shifted this was always doing its job right yeah um these were cultural centers religious centers spiritual centers and these weren't the only ones there was a lot of them but this was very important i mean we're 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 talking about these two as focal points for now but um it it doesn't just stand the test of time, but it also stands the test of political change. Yeah. Right? Like, that's another thing that I appreciate so much about architecture is, like you said, some of the inscriptions on the walls and whatnot. Yeah. Somebody could have come in 50 years later and be like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's change this all but up. You, and whatever but you know what else is, right? is so amazing about this is the fact that, and we've mentioned this before, and, and you know, when I made that video about my my pros and cons of being in Armenia. Mm-hmm. These people are ancestors. Of course. Thousands of years ago believed and understood that education was number one. It was everything. It was it was the the it was the the backbone. It was the 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 foundation of everything. Well this was based based on based on our understanding, and you know how I feel about this, but I'm not going to get into it, but based on our understanding of world history and the movement forward, right? Yeah. This was a time, 9th, 10th, 11th century, which preceded the Renaissance, which yeah. was the illumination of mankind, right? It This was a time period where a lot of people were beginning to learn how to read. You're coming out of the Dark Ages. At least yeah. this is what we've been taught with historical narrative is... You had clergymen who taught the Bible, let's say, or any yeah. historical text to people who didn't know how to read, which was apparently the masses. And I'm going to use the word apparently. Yeah. But this was, like you said, education. This was yeah. a time of people getting educated and enlightened, which then, of course, led into eventually the Renaissance era, yeah. right? Yeah. So anyway, moving on. The establishment of the kingdom of Tashir under Gurgen and the subsequent proclamations of kingdoms in Parisos and Sunik bear testament to the tumultuous state of Armenian politics during the latter part of the 10th century. The fragmentation of the once cohesive kingdom of Armenia can be attributed to both internal and external pressures, of course, that influenced the region's political uh, mil- milieu, let's call it that, um, the rise of Gurgen and his desire to proclaim himself as king was, much like his uncle Mushar, portrays the ambitions of um, local rulers who, uh, sensing the central authority's weakness, aspired for more independence and control. Of course. Well, I mean, that's the local DJs trying to be the <laughs> top DJ. I want more listeners. <laughs> Such aspirations were not confined to Tashish, of course. They were a uh, recurring theme across the Armenian highlands. Um, this fragmentation was further amplified with uh, Senekerim Sevada's declaration of kingship in Parisos. The timing of these uh, secessionist moves often corresponded with the larger, po- larger political disturbances 
faced by some about the second. Um, God, even even in a time of bloom, yeah, bloom, like you still had some sort of power struggle. Like people weren't happy. Like, oh, we need to protest things. Well, I, I mean, it, it, I personally think it's it's just greed. That's all it is. I mean, you know, it's like, why should one king get all the wealth and all the, Mind the you. thing? Uh, you know, because don't forget, they're small kings themselves, right? Yeah. So they're like... It's a power It's a power grab. A, a uh, power uh, struggle. Uh, power, not power grab. Power struggle. But but listen, hold on. Before power grab, I, I, I just want to understand. I want to put myself in that position. Okay. So you have the king of kings, and you yourself are the sub-king of this area. Mm-hmm. Okay. How, I mean, you have to be content with what you have and the position you're at. Uh, you're at, and and you know, obviously, um, you know, to become the next king, you can't because if somebody has a son or a brother or whatever, it goes the lineage goes that sure. way, right? So, but still, it's like to to go against your nation, your kingdom. I just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a different, I just don't see it. I, I the, That part of the greed just baffles well, this, this, me. Like, this goes into that saying, you know, you give your hand, they'll take your arm. Yeah. Right. So who's to say, and this is all, of course, assumption and, and opinion of something that occurred a thousand years ago. Um, we don't know everyday details, obviously, but who's to say that maybe there were some particular areas that we're not discussing obviously and what we're talking about today where maybe they were neglected to some degree some other township got a little bit more yeah. and this township didn't so now they have a problem well why did that person get this and we didn't get this right like now you're starting yeah. to deal with particularities um no i get it but still you know to, like to, we, to, don't, we don't know the details to secede from the kingdom like come on it must man. have been serious yeah, it must have been serious, okay. right? Well, um, well, anyway, continuing as somebody grappled with these issues um, and external threats um, like the Saladid invasion, mm-hmm. internal frac- fractions gained momentum as we're discussing the alignment of secessionist kings with external entities, secessionist kings. How yeah. many of them were they? External entities such as Adud al Dal. Aldala, uh, Adwala, Adwala, Al- Aldwala. Yeah, sorry. Al-Dwala. Hold on. Let me say yeah. that again. Adud Aldwala yep. of the Buyid dynasty of Iran's highlights. Sorry, my Iranian compatriots, for for butchering that name. The complex web of alliances that emerged in this area era, many aimed at diminishing the influence of Sambat II. Of course, because he had a lot of governing control yeah. over things. Yeah. Right, the guy was on top of his stuff. Yeah. Furthermore, the formation of the Sunni kingdom in the backdrop of the Saladid invasion exemplifies the opportunistic nature of regional lords mm-hmm, mm-hmm. during times of external strife. The, I mean, just pounce on weakness, right? Like any, any, like water. Yep. Like just yeah. find so that look, crack. Looking for that opportunity. Yeah, find that crack. Yeah. The inability of Sambat II to counter these internal challenges during times of external invasions provides a stark contrast to the unity that once characterized Armenia. We are living through this right now. We're always living and, through um, it. I'm sorry to to bring today into part of history, but we've we've you know last episode we talked about this. This division within our culture, our our, our nation, our kingdoms has always been the downfall. And that is why we went from these mass, mass landscapes that are Armenian to what we are today. And now Mm -hmm. we're fighting for a tiny piece of historical land that has always been Armenian land. And even today, you see the division. I mean, the amount of political parties there are in Armenia, (laughs) the, the opposition to what they are doing to what the government's doing uh, to what's happening in Artsakh. It's like a script that what we're reading right now is pretty much repeating yeah, itself. It's, it's, his, it's history repeating itself. It always yeah. has. This is and why again, because of an outside force. 
And, Always. And, and that's and that's a, another topic for another type of podcast. Too. Yeah. Um, but again, it's the same thing over and over. This is happening a thousand, thousand, one hundred years ago, guys. And this is why me and me and you always stress, learn your history. It doesn't matter, not just Armenian, but like wherever, wherever you're from. Maybe you have some Greek in you. Maybe you have some Italian, whatever, whatever, whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah. The fact that you learn that history, you start understanding everything that's happening today. Like the matrix it's like yeah. everything just slows down yeah. whoa yeah this makes complete sense man yep. yep because these people who run things even today listen the clothes they, might have changed the education yeah, might have yeah, changed but, they, but the but system's they, still but kind yeah, of the but same they, right? but they know they know their history as well they've studied these things and they use these tactics maybe add another stack of pancakes on it yeah Same well, thing. Maybe the perspective of Stepanos Orbelian, the prominent thir 13th century historian, mm -hmm. provides a retrospective view of these tumultuous period. Orbelian's lamentations on the uh, fracturing of Armenia into smaller, ineffectual states high, uh, highlight the border of ramifications of these uh, secessionist movements. These smaller kingdoms, despite their initial aspirations for power and autonomy, found themselves vulnerable to large, larger and more established neighboring Islamic dynasties. There you go. Mm -hmm. You separate, mm -hmm. you're tiny, then and you're you going to be stepped up. up. You yeah. yeah, you get eaten up. The overarching narrative emerging from these, uh, this era is one of the great kingdom facing both internal descent and external pressures yeah. undergoing a metamorphosis. Oh my god i <laughs> yeah well i mean it's, it's it resonates it's so much with today the kingdom of armenia which once stood united now found itself dissolving into various smaller entities each with its own ambitions and challenges yeah. the intricate uh, interplay of internal power struggles combined with external in, uh, invasions and alignments uh, encapsulates the intricacies of medieval armenian politics yeah i mean this is this is like a spider web of of just it's a mess too, it's too many directions yeah too many directions and, and again i'm not i'm not centering that or saying that this is more special than any other place in the world but you have too many things happening at in once this yeah. particular area of the world right yeah. with again after and don't repeat, forget some the rise of islam and different caliphates yeah. different sects yeah. of islam it, it, we want mentioned. we want to keep something in mind guys the this is all taking place in a 20 year period yeah so imagine how much happened i mean 20 years is not Still, that I mean, long. No, well i mean in, but, in hindsight it kind of is well but 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 all of this, this these changes happening in 20 years, it's a lot yeah it's yeah. a lot you know uh, at least in my opinion it's like building 55 towers yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so the delicate balance between l religious legitimacy political ambition and the struggles for uh, regional supremacy continued to dominate the Armenian political landscape while it was not unusual for feudal entities uh in the middle ages to seek external alliance the turning of armenian lords to muslim emirs Mm -hmm. bypassing their own religious and cultural traditions exemplifies mm -hmm. the lengths to which they went to secure their aspirations and ouch that is ouch wow uh -huh. this was the situation sambat Sunni found himself in poor king by seeking the blessing of the rawadid emir abul uh, haja hussein the first and the weed emir abdul al dawal for his kingship he knowingly traded legitimacy in the eyes of the Armenian church and the Armenian political establishment for potential stability in power. Yeah. Such choices were not without their cost, as highlighted by the backlash he faced for turning away from traditional Armenian coronation yeah. rights. In the political climate of the day, these perceived betrayals of Armenian traditions in alignment with foreign powers, especially from rival rival religious domains was not taken <coughs> lightly no 
I mean, this is, I mean, it sounds devastating just talking about it now. Yeah. Right. But I don't know. I guess, I guess, I mean, he had to be desperate. Yeah. To, some people would say, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I get it. But I but, mean, listen, I, I, I don't want to, but at what point side with him, but what, at, at, what point at some point, you know, are you talking death, about death sus- before dishonor type of, I deal? know, but here's the thing again, not to, not to side with him, but Again, we don't know what he was thinking, what was happening, what type of relationships sure, he had. And but I'm not criticizing. You have a kingdom, and then all of a sudden you have all these secessions happening, and you're at the point where we don't know how many collapse. You know, collapse. So he made a decision, the wrong decision, but he did. But he end of the day, you know, he was, you know, he was not looked no, no favorable no so at all. Um, Gagi Kartruni's earlier precedents um, in Vaspurakan gave a clear indication that seeking foreign validation for one's rule, especially outside of Armenian right, um, as we are discussing, yeah. was um, fraught with challenges, to say the least. While it could bring temporary power and perhaps even some form of stability, um, it came at the cost of aligning or alienating key sections of the Armenian establishment. Yeah. Sambat II's reign, however, offered a contrast. His focus on economic prosperity and his ability to extend influence over the secessionist regions, particularly Parisos and Sunik, underlines a period of consolidation, damage control at this point, right? Yeah. While he may have been challenged by these upstart kingdoms, it appears that the latter part of his rule, he managed to restore some semblance of unity, bringing parts of these regions back under the central Bakraduni fold. The reign of Gagik II Bakraduni continued this trend of reclaiming fragmented territories as he took over parts of the Gardman, Parisos, and Sunik regions. It symbolized not just the reestablishment of political power, but also the reass- reassertion of Armenian traditions and legitimacy over the regions that had strayed. Yeah. Kind of re-injected that yeah. Armenian goodness. And we're going to cover his Armenian his goodness, right? Yeah. Like just kind of pop it back in there. Um, these oscillations between fragmentation and consolidation, between foreign alliances and domestic legitimacy characterize a tumultuous era in Armenian history. This period stands as a testament to the interplay of religion, culture, and politics in shaping the destiny of a nation of nations and kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, King Sambat II died in 990 and was honorably buried in the capital city of Ani. According to Stepan of Tarun, the king died after the death of his wife, whose untimely passing had become unbearable for the king. He had, a, he had a broken heart, died from a broken heart. Sambat, that's a, that's a real thing, by the way. I know it is. I'm not making yeah. fun of it. Sambat II did not have a male heir and was thus succeeded by the throne uh, with his younger brother, mm-hmm. Gagik I. Uh, King Gagik uh, I ascended to the throne during a pivotal time in Armenian history with Ani, the city of a thousand and one churches, as the seat of his power. Gagik I uh, presided over the era marked by significant architectural, cultural, and political developments. Mm -hmm. Under his reign, the city of Ani flourished as an architectural marvel and the hub for trade and cultural exchange. Its grand churches, fortifications, and palaces symbolize the wealthy or the wealth and the influence of the Armenian kingdom, drawing attention from across the region. Yet, as much as Ani was a jewel of Gagik's crown, the internal challenges posed by ambitious Nakharars, oh, those Nakharars, those Nakharars, and other members of the Bagratuni family threatened to destabilize his realm. Some good many bad yeah more bad than anything the uh landscape of medieval armenia was constantly shifting as we've talked about sure was the power dynamics between the central authority representing rep- represented by the king and various feudal lords and nahadars played out in a complex web of alliances see there's that word web betrayals 
and um, power struggles. King Gogik I faced these challenges head-on, aiming to centralize his authority and curtail the ambitions of those who sought to fragment their kingdoms. This centralizing effort um, was complemented by Gogik's commitment to art, culture, and spirituality, which usually brings people together. With this, with his queen, Katrani II, hey, by, you said I it said right. it right. Yeah. I learned from the best, my friend. <laughs> Thank by, you. <laughs> by his side, they patronized artists, scholars, and uh, theologians, bolstering the Armenian identity and its Christian roots. This golden age, which it was, by the way, golden age, sure was, however, huh? um, would also witness significant challenges from external forces, as we've mentioned multiple times, as the tides of history swept across the region. And of course, yeah. it is just because where it was located. Yeah. And uh, too many we, influences, too many powers from left, right, up, down, wherever. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we aim to dive deeper into these stories, capturing the drama, the glory, and the trails faced by the armenian kings uh i should say trials not trails faced trials by trials and trials and trails and tribulations yes. queens and their subjects as we journey through history we aim to shed light on the tapestry um of uh these events which shaped the ancient civilization and enduring legacy left behind you know there's a lot of these yeah. these stories that haven't been told the right yeah, way. Yeah, no, so things, things. Hopefully, we're doing justice to it. You know, thank you for being a part of this. Like we we we're trying to explore some of the more um, take take certain periods, time periods, and maybe explore things in a little bit more detail. Yeah, to kind of paint a better yeah. picture, a more detailed picture yeah. of of lesser known tales in uh, yeah. in our history yeah right it's um, um it's it's kind of like a crash course again i guarantee a lot of you don't know much about sambat the second or just Kagi the Kartruni, name just, just, just the name and the height of ani yeah, and, and what the they did. Ratunis and whatnot yeah. i mean neither did we neither yeah. did we yeah you know this is a lot of this stuff when we find this information yeah. is learning we're yeah. we're learning about this too yeah yeah, of like course. There's a lot of stuff in here that I didn't know. Of course, of course, you and, and and you learn about it, and know. and and it it makes you um, understand where, as an Armenian where you came from, your history, and like I said, the, and, and it really opens your eyes. Of course, it does. Um, so stay tuned. We got more coming yeah. up. A lot more yeah. uh, content to bring we're, to you. We're guys. doing we're doing our best to get like to to yeah. not paint with as broad a brush as. Yeah sometimes historical narratives can tend to do of course and uh we're we're eventually going to also start a segment where we're going to do um stories of just regular folks that had interesting lives throughout history that and, may, and ties you, and ties in yeah too. you may have never heard about uh, i certainly haven't but i've learned so much about people that were just you know stories told about them and there's there's books written about them but you don't you probably never heard about them because these books were written a long time ago so that's another thing we're gonna try to do is tell stories of amazing men and women grassroots who did who did some stuff that that no one talks about anymore yeah. you know they, they weren't they weren't uh you know kings or queens no. or, or anything but, of that sort or or even in but if in there's but if early there's, you know 20th century yeah but so. if there's if there's one thing i can safely say is whenever you do any historical research on anything you learn about like say oh this and this happened in yeah. said country or said civilization but then when you start reading accounts especially further along in our history and in our timeline yeah when you start hearing more personal accounts of things that people went through that connects the dots to that time era yeah. and things that you it makes things more fascinating yeah right no i agree i agree i agree well um that was it as far as king sambat the second goes um uh like i said we are uh, trying to finalize the day with with uh christina Moranzi, who we will be covering the great 1001 churches yeah. There's of city of Ani and the Bagratunis because yeah. again this this happened during their if, time. If you haven't watched any of her videos and you're not familiar with her name or her presentations, 
go look up her name. Yeah. I promise you will not be disappointed. No, I agree. And I that's agree. why we're 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 super excited about yeah. so having a return. So hopefully next episode, if not, we'll 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 go and cover uh King Gogik the first uh and his trials and tribulations with his queen Katranid mm-hmm. the second. Um so um but yeah besides that um let's see oh i you know i want to announce that we are opening up the option for sponsorship on the show uh but we ask for people to uh, you know if you want to become a sponsor at least have it be product or service that is somehow related educational or something yeah. that that's providing a, a good service you know we, we're not looking to just get anybody or you know sell any product um it, you know if, if if you have something that you feel that is going to help in the educational uh, space yeah educational space cultural anything mm-hmm. of that sort reach out to us you can email us at pod at medhedosna.com or messages on instagram uh, and we'll definitely respond and let you know how it works. Um, besides that, um, am I missing anything? No. 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 Oh, we're on threads now. So follow us at Medhead Snatch. We are? Yep. I didn't tell you, but we're on threads. So follow us. Uh, I don't we're know. Not, I haven't even posted on, anything. We're not on <laughs> X. Uh, we are we are on X. Our, I know. Our I know. But hold on. I just, I, just, I just wanted to say yeah, it. I know. It's weird saying Twitter. X. Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. the blue bird yeah but uh yeah that's pretty much it uh hope you guys enjoyed this and uh as, welcome back yeah welcome back season four is yeah, launching back. taking off i'm not gonna sing it <laughs> you're not no i already right. sang it to you yesterday okay all right so Maybe uh, next time <laughs> as we always say at the end of the show respect one another love one another until the next episode take care of yourselves